Welcome to episode 24 in the KIPPS Personal Trainer Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of KIPPS and Kettlebell Concepts. Today's topic is one that every personal trainer has had to plan for, training the male client in the 35 to 55 age range. In our industry, we hear about training active adults, training young athletes, but what about the male client that is working 40 plus hours a week and looking to stay healthy? Our guest today is Nick Clayton, who has had stops in the industry as a personal trainer, working in sport performance, was at NSCA for eight years, and more recently as the COO of the Pain-Free Performance Certification. Nick's educational background is in exercise science with an MBA as well, and those definitely shaped his responses in this episode. Let's get to the episode. Today we have a great topic for personal trainers, those that are working in facilities or even working on their own. When we look at the populations available to train, we sometimes think about the stay-at-home moms, the active aging population, but a big population to consider is the gentlemen, the men that are 35 to 50 to 55 in that range right there, the weekend warriors. And these in this population, there are things that are tend to be common, I'll say, you know, what their goals are, what they want to achieve through the training. So Nick, what are some of the physiological commonalities you've seen with this population when training them? Uh, Thanks. uh, So that's a great question. And uh, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't kind of tell you real quick about why this is a passion for me, why it's important. So when I was 22, uh, Grad school for ex phys, uh, master level trainer, you know, soccer player, all these, all these good things. I'm like, I know everything. I've got this thing all figured out. Right? This is simple. Got all my my CSCS, got all my certifications. Uh, I have these clients come in, you know, middle aged men, and it's like, oh uh, yeah, we're gonna bench, man. We're gonna leg press. We're gonna do all the good stuff, and. Uh, they wouldn't get results. Like they would a bit to an extent, right? But they'd always go like, oh, my shoulder hurts. You know, come in like, hey, I'm tired, right? I'm like, oh, muscle through it, man. You gotta push through, this is life. You gotta, you gotta do it. And uh, it didn't occur to me until I started turning 40. And I'd start waking up like sore and tight. The workouts had to change. And uh, I'm a smart dude. You know, I've been in the field 20 years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it just kind of clicked and like, look, there's different things going on. So when I look now at middle-aged men, people like myself, you know, it's, it's not so much the assessment and their performance. Those things are important, but it's, it's the whole picture. And we'll get into that a little bit. But by and large, what you'll see is guys in general sitting down they're at an office desk most of the day right so their hips get tight their forward posture so their shoulders get tight but they're also stressed they're not breathing right you know they're sacrificing other things for their family for their kids right? so they don't sleep well they don't eat well all these things change so to answer your question you know physically what we'll see is it's typically like People will be tired of fatigue. Uh, they don't move well. Their forward shoulder is the biggest thing. They're a bit kyphotic. Uh, and then their hips are a bit jacked up. It's an untechnical term that I like to use. But essentially, anterior pelvic tilt. Hip flexors get tight. So it's all those things you see kind of in the normal population. But for guys especially, you know, with families and other life priorities, it's it's more about the other components that go into it. So I would say, like specifically in an assessment, you're going to see you you're not going to see so many differences from the normal population in terms mm-hmm. of you know weak glutes, weak upper back, you know tight upper back, bad breathing posture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those are kind of the the kickoff things you'll see. It's going to be real quick and easy. You're going to see someone walk in. And you're like, hey, you know, you walk in into your pelvic tilt. You're a bit round in the shoulders. So those are the, the two things that I'd say you're going to see right off the bat, almost across all populations. Yeah, yeah. And I like how you mentioned the mindset of a lot of 
these men that walk in, they're exactly how you said, sacrificing a lot for their family. They're working long hours. They're in these crouched over positions and they're at that point in their life. And I think that's something that trainers need to think about that, where these people are mentally. And in my profession, when I did personal training years ago, and it's not like it was that long ago, but years ago I did personal training and a lot of them would tend to sacrifice their bodies for work. And now all of a sudden, just how you mentioned, they wanted to get back in the gym. Okay, let's do some bench press. Let's do all the the normal things that I used to do when I was younger, when I played sports. And sometimes they got injured or sometimes they had limited results, but that led them to you. And with that, as you and I will talk about throughout this episode, sometimes they had injuries, prior injuries. Sometimes the mindset wasn't quite there. Did you ever uncover any of those um, psychological things that uh, barriers, exactly how I just said with the, they like to do the bench squats, lift heavy weight. Did you ever have to deal with those psychological barriers or of trying to show them, no, we need to do maybe a little bit lighter weights, or we need to look a little more at these types of exercises. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So what you'll, it's so what it's funny. So my experience, you'll get clients across the board. You know, like let's take females in particular. They'll turn forty, and they come in and they're like, you know what? I had a baby, and I gained weight. All, all these different things. For guys that, that hire personal trainers, it's almost always in my experience. I was always in great shape. You know, I had a six pack growing up. Whatever. You know, I always went to the gym. You know, I had great arms. And it's like, yeah, you're 20 years old, you have a ton of testosterone, and anything you do, like, yeah, you're going you're gonna to look good. Uh, so their mindset is, I just can't do it anymore. So they're coming in, and it's like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work out, but, like, every time I do, it hurts, right? Like, or I've got to spend 45 minutes, you know, to warm up, then I'll do deadlifts, and I'll feel great the next three days I can't walk. I wake up the next day and I'm sore and stiff. So for guys, it's more of like a, it's more of a frustration that they're going to come in with, they're going to present with. Like all this, like they're coming to you like, look, I know how to lift. Or at least they think they do. Uh, I don't mean that in a negative way, but they, they have lifting experience. Right? Mm-hmm. So they come in and it's like, you just, you just need some help like because this hurts all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of reframing things and getting them to understand that, you know what, no matter who you are, we all wear out, right? Whether it's sports or bad lifting, daily job duties, you know, the way that we do either physical job duties uh, or just sitting in a chair all day, like that changes your structure, increases stress on the joints, and it all comes down to motor control. So, yeah. like, if you look at the research, Basically, every single person on the planet, you know, over 30 years old, has joint damage, has joint wear and tear, has discomiations. And not all of these, those people present with pain. And what most of the research suggests is it's about stability and motor control. So stability in the sense of, you know, do you know how to brace? Does your body subconsciously know how to brace? So when you move into a certain position, you know, are you stable? Yeah. That ultimately comes into motor control, right? So it's it, it's basically the brain saying, hey, when I do this movement, do I know how to first lock in joints, stabilize joints, and then allow free range of motion? What happens is when we sit down, we get tight, we get inhibited, and then all of a sudden motor control becomes different and we recruit different muscles. So... Mm-hmm. These guys that will come in and say, hey, hey man, like 45, like I want to lift again. I've got limited time. Uh, I know how to lift. I know how to be strong. I just need you to help me, you know, get stronger. So they're thinking it's, it's the programming or it's, you know, it's something bigger than it really is. You mm-hmm. have to back them down. So psychologically, it's, it's almost like, hey, here's what we have to do. We almost have to unload you. Like, I just want you to be aware of, the most important thing, like, look, let's talk about two things. Those two things that we need to identify is one, what's the cause of the pain, right? So talk to me about your day. 
you know, like when do you hate me? You know, and if I look back when I'm 20 years old, I'm like, oh, I don't hate you, like bullshit. I don't care about this stuff. As I've gotten older, I'm like, yeah, man, like if I sit in my chair for four hours, if I fly on a plane, my back is wrecked for three days. You know, so okay, so sitting posture is hurt. Okay, what else? Well, when I wake up in the morning, sometimes my back hurts. Okay, well, how do you sleep? And it's it's the back end things that we need to address. So we need to work with clients first off and say, let's identify those triggers that are causing pain. So maybe someone works you know, in a warehouse, they do a physical job, and you find out like they do 2,000 reps of bending over and picking up 10 pound packages. It's like that's a trigger. So how do we work through that? So number one is let's identify it. Say okay, we're gonna we're gonna build a strategy so we teach you how to move better throughout your day, whether it's because of your sitting posture or whatever it is. Let's identify it. Let's let's make sure we, we address that and correct that. Number two, it's hey man, you you're not broken. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Everyone's got these aches and pains. You can definitely get stronger and live a great life through these. We just need to create stability. So we do that. By backing things down and readdressing how we motor program. So essentially that becomes, hey, let's go back to the basics. Let's let's identify the triggers, let's remove those triggers in your daily activity, and then let's just get you on the ground, get you breathing a bit, and reestablish basic core control so that you can control your pelvis, you can control your spine in your basic movements. Let's rebuild that in. And then let's go from there. That's kind of number two. And then the, the added piece is, and this is the, the thing that people love most is, you know, for most guys that are a bit older, time is a constraint. Like they don't have two hours to the gym. And everyone's like, oh, my, my gym workout doesn't take two hours. And like, it kind of does because you have to leave your job, drive, you have to get in, you have to check in, you have to change, you do all these things to work out. Warm up, work out, cool down, shower again, get rechange. That's a long process. It's not as simple as saying, like, hey, I've got an hour to work out. That makes it a bit tougher. So the other the other crux of it is to tell someone, or the character at the end of the stick, essentially, once we remove the triggers, clean those up, once we reestablish motor control, teach you how to stabilize things, we can get you to more high intensity workouts that are shorter, that have way more return on, on your investment. Meaning we can hit one or two strength exercises, do some kind of metabolic conditioning, and boom, like your body's mm-hmm. gonna feel fantastic. You clean up the nutrition, and all of a sudden, you know, you're able to work out in 30 minutes, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, plus, uh, plus minus on both sides of that. You can have a good functioning life where you actually look good, feel good, and, and working out's not, it doesn't take up, you know, two hours, four days a week. If you want to spend that time with your family, with your friends, your job, you know, and house chores and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you mentioned, all the pieces about the motor control aspect of it. And really with learning new new patterns or even reestablishing old patterns, somebody in the 35 plus range might have that mindset that, oh, I, I used to do this in the past. I can just throw back on the same weight or I used to have really great technique and you know, there we see this is where some injuries might occur. And one of the pieces of equipment that I used to love when working with this population and I utilize a lot in my own training now is uh, Viper Pro and I'll say the TRX Ripstick and other companies had similar items like that. Those are just the name brand ones, but the same modalities and with other companies had the same similar principles, but I like to utilize that with it intended to be the little bit on the end of the, the higher end of the spectrum in terms of the population we're talking about now, but being able to tie this into activities that they like outside of work and outside of family, whether it was golf, softball, running, activities that they enjoyed on top of what their normal working out was. And once they were able to see how this would benefit their clubs, 
club speed or oh, this would benefit their running or this would benefit their fielding if they're playing softball they started to change their mindset that okay i do like this or this will help help me and you could still sprinkle in you know, some of the traditional stuff but a lot of the things that you mentioned there with learning how to stabilize your spine brace your core though those types of tools teach it during movement. So the term that they use a lot is, is loaded movement training. And I really see the application for everybody really. But uh, with this, this population specifically, it was a great way to tie those in. For yourself, Nick, what kinds of programming would you try to do with them? Was it typically uh, strength training based or would you try to, I think you already touched on a couple of these pieces already, but is the programming, would you say, when you're starting to take it back for them, more strength training based, endurance based, um, or would that just depend upon the client? Well, so I, I start with kicking it off is, you know, guys that come in typically want, you know, they want to be stronger, but more in the middle age, they're more concerned with feeling good, looking yeah. good, mm-hmm. relatively, as opposed to being like, Hey, you know, like I want to, I want to squat 400 pounds. Uh, most guys will give that up and be like, yeah, you know what? Like, I just want to be able to do cool stuff. So when it comes to programming for me, the, the biggest thing that we can do, there's two, right? So one is strength, like absolute strength. So I'm not talking like six plus reps. I'm teaching people after we re-educate of horse stability, bracing, you know, getting them from ground-based positions. So, you know, glute bridges, planks, you know, building pillar stability, getting them standing, teaching them how to brace in different positions, and then developing total body strength and foundational movements. Uh, so for me, it's either it's squat, hinge, lunge, push, pull, press, and or carry. Like those are foundational things that that all get locked in with strength. So people look at strength, you know, see YouTube videos, and some dude bench pressing in shit form. You know, it's like, hey, I, I, I bench press 355. And you look at it like, you just gave up your shoulders, your back, and everything else for a stupid ass video that makes you look dumb, right? And I don't tell people this, obviously, but like when I see these videos, I'm like, that's not a good rep. Like, that's like me saying, yeah, I can squat 450 pounds if I'm on the wrist, my spine will help. Uh, like, what can you actually drive through and create stability in? So when I look at strength, I'm looking at sub five, five rep max. Like I want people to get really strong and working through sticking points. So that's kind of my crux or what I look at as, as best is. I want your form to be way more rock solid than you think it could be. Uh, and I want you to overcome sticking points because that becomes a limiting factor. You know, that's it's almost self-selecting. Like, look, you're not going to push that weight if you can't do it the right way. So then you, you create that stability, you create bracing. And essentially what that's doing physiologically is retraining motor control when you're weakest to overcome the best strength. So you're not giving up stability for numbers. Uh, and that essentially, you know, in my opinion, ties the whole body together. So the whole body is connected. So if you can overcome sticking points in those big movements, that translates really well to activities of daily living. It just locks in longevity, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, so not to not to deviate, but I was literally at the gym today, uh, commercial gym, and uh, I'm doing the speed squats paired with some kettlebell work and uh, and in windmills, kettlebell windmills. I'm not kidding. Some guy comes over to me, super nice guy, and uh, I, I got headphones in. I'm like, hey man, I got about three minutes. It's all yours. I don't know. I just I've never seen that before. <laughs> He's like, what are you doing? I'm like kettlebell windmill. What does it work? Like, and, and I stumbled a bit, honestly. I was like, well, I'm going to check my question. It mm-hmm. works your body. And, like, it works It works your body. Like, my toes, my fingertips, that's what it works. 
He's like, is it an oblique <laughs> exercise? I'm like, it'll work your obliques, but it works like it works your body. It's it's for me, it's shoulder stability tied in to mobility, right? So that when I'm mountain biking or when I'm picking up my dog in a weird position, mm-hmm. I'm stable. Like on one foot, I'm two feet. Like I can move through range of motion. It, it's creating more of a neurological uh, shift so that I can move through positions and control those positions. So that's kind of what I look for. So it's, it's strength overall in the foundational movement. So I want someone to be strong in tension. I want them to row. I want them to hinge. I want them to squat, lunge and carry to some extent, press. Um, but my programs, by and large, will cover one or two of those big lifts, depending on how many times a week someone can work out. And then I pair that typically with a, a pairing circuit. So if it's a, if it's a hinge dominant day, uh, I might do I might do deadlifts as a strength exercise, and then I'll, I'll pair in like a, something like a power, and then a corrective, and then a core. You know, kind of a circuit. So it might be a deadlift. We do that first off after we warm up. That creates a series of deadlifts, and then it might be a kettlebell swing followed with some upper back pulling, scapular stability, posture, uh, just overall upper back health. And then it might pair that in with like some RKC planks. So you're pairing in. You get some dynamic activation of the hips. You get some hamstring work. You get some upper back, which are accessories that are also really great for saving the shoulders, tying into the core. And we might finish that off with, with some, um, some eccentric I like hamstring it. work. Hamstring things. And then they even add in some calf raises. If you're like, calf raises, you're not a nice person. I'm like, yeah, but that's a great way to increase range of motion at the ankle joint. You want to sit there and stretch your calves. Or can you actually work in calf work, like peak at the top, and then work through that full range of motion and hold at the bottom? Because what you can stabilize, you can attain in terms of range of motion. You know, if we don't go into you know, deep range of motion in the calves and we just stretch them, yeah, you can stretch things, that's great. Go for a run, see how that feels. Like you might feel good, you don't have that active actual mm-hmm. range of motion. Because it goes back to motor control, you, you can't control that joint position. So I want people to be really strong in those deep rings of motion. Because then when they go out and they run the tough motor, you know, they go play tennis, or they're just playing in the park with their kids, you know, they can control deceleration of their gait pattern. Essentially, like when they're extending their leg when they're running with their kid, changing direction, like they've got that. You know, so they come in and for older guys, like I do lower volume, higher intensity. We get in, we focus high focus on quality movement and they're aware of it. And then they go out and it's like, you know, like workouts feel good. You know, I'm feeling good, my body feels good. But what's really cool is like I went up to the prison with a kid, I got up and I said, like, that was the most fun I've ever had, and I'm not sore for two days. Like this Mm -hmm. is fantastic. And what I think is different, and we're gonna come back to talk about some assessments that you favor, but for the listeners, the perspective that Nick has, and even I have, is that Nick used to work for NSCA, used to work for pain-free performance specialist certification, and which is different than what some trainers, the route that they've taken in the industry. And that's the beauty of this podcast as we talk about different programming, different uh, modalities, all types of things. And the perspective might vary. So Nick, so far, I've heard you talk a lot about motor control, which one of my favorite topics within the exercise sciences. Do you have maybe a, some type of certification or did you take some type of course that you're like, wow, this really helped shape how I approach training? A part of that and why I ask it is that I will say that the programming that you laid out, that you just laid out is something that some people might say, well, why are you doing so many circuits? Why there's the intervals? Why is why is this exercise after that exercise? And, and maybe it's because they're, they're how they started or how they were trained. They did a lot of, uh, cons- I'll say, just traditional strength training exercises. But was there some type of course certification or um, some type of educational course that you took? 
So I will first off say that the best trainers that I've come across are the ones that are passionate about education and they'll stop learning. They just read things, uh, they figure things out, they ask questions. That's the best trainer. It's not the trainer that has the master's degree, you know, all these certifications. Like those things can be helpful, but they're a bit ancillary. I always equate, so again, like eight plus years at NSCA, uh, like I equate certifications with a driver's license. It is essentially saying like, yep, in a clean environment, you know how to pass the test to do certain things. So if I say, hey, you know how to squat, they can say, yes, your feet should be hip width apart, you should have a neutral spine, like that's all fine and But going back to a driving test, you pass your driver's license. Now you live in Colorado, you have a snowstorm, sleeting in ice on the ground. Like, you're like, oh shit, man, like car reacts different <laughs> in reality, right? No one taught me that. So certifications are great, but they're limited. Same thing with driver's license. Like you pass the driver's license test, doesn't mean you're ready to go drive in the snow. You've got to go get that advanced education, that advanced you know, information. So I would always say, you know, you know, get your accredited certifications. Uh, education is incredibly important. And I, I look at education as a way of deciphering BS. Because once you get some baseline info on exophysiology, on functional anatomy, you can then read something and be like, you know what, that makes no sense physiologically. Like, it just doesn't, doesn't jive. Because there's a lot of BS out there in the industry. So I would always say, you know, get some education, get your certification. Okay, now you're ready to practice. Okay, so work with those types of people in the industry that are reputable, that are research-based, uh, that put good info out there. You know, and there's a ton of those guys out there. People like Nick Cuminello, Eric Cressy, Tony Gentle Core, uh, John Russell. Like th those are guys that are just constantly feeding free info because they're passionate about the industry. And, and the list goes on. But read their stuff. You know, go out. You know, you ask questions. Get as much, read as much information as you can, and you'll see common trends come up where it's like, hey, this bracing thing, that, that's kind of important. Everyone keeps talking about bracing. You know, these, this McGill bird dog, who's this McGill guy? Like, Stu McGill is the back doctor of the world, essentially. Uh, so it, it's almost like do some sleuthing, man. Just, just commit to education, just yep. commit to reading. You know, don't, don't follow someone that has big arms because they have big arms. Like, it's, it's great. Most guys that are working out in the fashion are going to look good. Uh, and we don't follow the guy that's just like, hey, here's, a, here's my favorite three bicep exercises. I got to tell you right off the bat, if I, I see a title like that, I'm like, uh, I don't think you get it. Right? It's, it's guys, it's like, hey, how to, how to get great arms by deadlifting and doing heavy carries. Um, when it comes to certificates, so certifications, there's right now that I think there's 14 accredited certifications. So to get accredited, you just basically have to submit all your information to a third party that says, you know what, yeah, you you provide a research-based background on your information. Uh, your testing procedures, you know, work. So it was beta tested, it was scored, evaluated, like you, you're accredited. But of those 14 that are accredited, there's usually, there's typically four, you know, in the industry right now that we look at that most people will say like, yeah, these are the top four. So it's NSCA, ACSM, NASM, and ACE. Uh, and of those four, NSCA and ACSM are very research-based. They're the most clinical, they're solid. Like they're gonna test you a lot on the physiological aspects of adaptation. We don't do a great job of practical programming, just in my opinion. You look at ACE and NASM, they do a really good job of saying, hey, here's a system that you can implement. Uh, and that looks at assessment and how to, you know, how to progress exercise and get more of a practical application. The problem there is what you'll see is you talk to someone who's NASM certified, who's got a corrective exercise specialist, you know, of course, in your development which is really good information. But 
you go through that course and what you know is what you see. So every single person that comes in, it's like, oh, they have atrial pelvic tilt. Oh, they've got poor posture. We can't train them. We're gonna we're gonna spend six weeks training my obese client who's got high blood pressure on prone cobras, you know, on thoracic extension. It's like, great. How about we get them to move safely? And we, we worry about that because if the weight comes off, they can move safely and they need to work out, the weight's gonna come down, the blood pressure's gonna come down. They're gonna feel better, they can get mm-hmm. healthier. So don't get pigeonholed by yep. a certification. Uh, and then beyond that, you look at more of what's formally known, like technically known as certificate programs. So those are things like an ECMAS, uh, your CrossFit level one, oh, that, that might be now a certification. Um, FMAS, your, your pain free performance specialist certification, like those weekend courses, essentially, they're not accredited by a third party. Those are fantastic ways to get better. And even things like Strong Perks, because they teach more specifically to uh, typically like a subsect or a, a smaller scope of practice. So if you look at Strong Perks, you know, they teach you a lot about kettlebells. You know, from my experience, I went through their, their stuff, like it is fantastic. It's bracing, they drill and drill and drill until you're really proficient and understand the movements. Um, those are add-ons, right? So even things like, like a Viper course or TRX stuff, that's just great education. Uh, so the more that people can get involved and immerse in that, the better. My one thing would be, don't take that as only one way to train, right? Take all the information in, and the best trainers are the ones that keep learning. They try things personally. They use things smartly. They implement them well with their clients. Say, hey, here's what I think works. Let me try this. And then they make up, not their own program, but they basically make or take all the information that they have and synthesize it in a simple way of saying, hey, Here's what I found works several. It's safe, it's effective, it gets you stronger, you know, and it's not that, you know, the latest, greatest, like, coolest exercise. Like, there's no latest, greatest, coolest exercise. Like, the best exercise are the fundamental ones that help you get stronger, help you get more fit. Yeah, yeah. I like, uh, there's uh, many pieces that I like what you said there. And, you know, I come from a, I originally, where we first talked was when I worked for one of the smaller companies, when I worked for Nesta. And, you know, it's one of the smaller accredited, uh, or sorry, one of the smaller companies that has uh, an accredited personal training program. Um, But that experience of working there made me believe that in my, and this is my opinion on this, that you could essentially be in the industry with a smaller certification, because in my opinion, what you do after the certification is what helps guide your career. Uh, getting a TRX, getting a kettlebell certification, getting education in other areas. And I think that I like you touched on this, this already was that don't put too much weight in that to start with just because each one has their focus and those there's pluses and minuses of each of them. And I think that, we can agree on that with each of the, the top big ones. Uh, you know, they have a variety of things that they emphasize, uh, but it's really expanding your mind and following. I agree a hundred percent on this, following the industry leaders like Eric Cressy, he, in my opinion, is the best personal trainer in the country. And he shares so much and a good quote, I think he put it on Twitter. I don't know when, I just remember it just because it really stuck with me was that a part of why he gives so much is that he's not worried about the content. I know that there's an old thought process that, oh, you, you got to save some of that. You got to save some of that good stuff for and make people pay for it. But his content that he gives away for free is better than what most people will make you pay for just because he's not worried that you're going to just watch all his free stuff. And, you know, you're not going to event, you're not going to buy one of his courses or whatever product that uh, he's selling, but he's, more than willing to give high level education to personal trainers. And I know that some enthusiasts that look at his stuff, cause I've seen the comments will say, oh, can you, why are you posting this? Or why can you dumb this down for me? 
but for fitness professionals, it's that good. And especially with his target audience, uh, baseball professionals and dealing with the rotator cuff, the shoulders, uh, the core, his stuff in that area is just top notch. So I definitely would second your comment about the industry pro- professionals, the the pioneers and whatnot, and following them and seeing what advice they're giving instead of the ones on social media that are talking about bigger arms. And I tend to see, and this is not directed at any one social media influence or anything like that, but I see a lot of the the individuals that have all these quote unquote followers. But if you go look at their likes, you look at their followers, you click on some of them and you're like, why does this person only have one follower? Why is this account doesn't look, why doesn't this account look real? And it's a lot of them pay for followers, likes, all that kind of stuff to make it seem like they're legitimate. And, you know, that's the thing with social media. But at the end, you know, the cream rises to the top, in my opinion. Um, but I think we're so, this is such a good topic to uh, talk a little bit more about just because we're both from that perspective of education and working with educational companies. Um, you know, with that, do you have any, I'll say, assessments that you tend to favor? Uh, over and I think that your perspective will be from this in, uh, as well. But do you have any assessments that you tend to favor with this population and uh, that we're going back to now? Yeah. So I'll start off with. So I did a two or three years ago. I did a three-hour in service at Idea World, their biggest convention. Uh, like 250 people in there. Uh, the whole three-hour course is basically how to do assessments is training and to me that's it's valuable information because as a professional you need to be able to break down and say okay what am i looking at like how do i get deeper dive how do i deeper dive into all this stuff so it's an ankle it's a hip it's a knee the back you know all those good things um and i, I think that's important uh, and things like FMS are fantastic because it, it teaches you how to look at movement just differently, more, more so from a holistic standpoint of hey, how some move. Um, currently, like at this point, I look at people just in general. So clients come in, I want to see. Uh, I'm looking at how they walk in the door, how they stand, how they sit. You know, are they shifting to one side? You know, when they walk, is their arm swing equally? Right, like are there abnormalities? Um, how do they hold themselves? Because that to me goes back to motor programming, tells me, hey, you know what? Like this is how someone moves, and if it's not smooth and, and just doesn't smell right, there's probably something there. So you, you can tease that out, but to the vast majority of people, you can do these assessments, but an assessment or a screen, I should say. It's a snapshot in time. So if you bring in some guy, have him do an overhead squat, he's probably gonna look like he's got tight ankles, you know, like tight thoracic. Um, so you look at those things and say, oh, here's what we're working on. But their mindset is, hey man, I just wanna train, like I just wanna feel good, right? I wanna feel like I've got a good workout. So if I take someone through a screen, and then spend 40 minutes in a workout doing corrective exercise, am I really serving the purpose? Am I playing physical therapist? So what I've kind of gotten into now is more of, you know what? Let's let's skip the assessment to an extent because I'm screening everything you do when you walk in, when we start moving. So if I have someone that comes in to work out, what I want to do, my goal for that day is to have them lift something heavy relative to what they control. I want to get a testosterone-based response. Like I want them to strain. I want them to struggle in the safest way they can. So if we take the squat, for example, when I say squat, I don't mean barbell back squat. I have someone come in, hey man, let's get you through, let's, let's get you some foam rolling, foam rolling, some activation, if you correct this, let's do some you know, it's fire for CNS. And now let's go work out. Do some bodyweight squats, you know, in the warm up. Okay, I can see where they're tight, where they're weak, how they're feeling. All right, you know what? Like, how's your back feel today? Like, you know, it's a little stiff. Yeah, I can tell you're kind of guarding. Okay, so let's see if we can't coach them up, up on that a little bit. 
So maybe that squat for them in that day is a goblet squat. And if you haven't done goblet squats, like you take a heavy ass goblet and put it in someone's hands, like they have to brace and stabilize and get their upper back powered up to, to an extent that they're not gonna feel on a back squat because you can kind of push through that. Uh, so that might be their their exercise of the day, you know, the squat movement of the day. You know, maybe we're doing three to five second negatives. That's going to light them up. And I'm getting constant feedback, and that's the art of coaching, right? So while I want to scream and I want to assess those things are important, my ultimate goal every time someone comes in, they're paying 80 bucks, is are you getting a good workout? Are you getting the hormonal response that I want out of it? So I would almost flip it and say, I've, I've kind of gone completely different avenue or direction and said, like, yeah, your assessment's important. I want that information. But really what I want to look at is where, where are you inhibiting? Where are you holding back? How can I open that up? And how can I give you a workout? Um, but to answer your question directly, I would almost look at the exercise as the assessment of the screen. Um, typically, it's going to be you know, things like you know, some kind of squat, some kind of push. Like a push-up, um, because that will tell me someone's how they're moving through their thoracic, if they're locked up, if they need more mobility, uh, it tells me in the moment I can see it. And you can say, okay, you know what? Let's mobilize it more. So let's let's get some sensibility through there, and then let's let's scale the exercise so that it fits what you're feeling today. Because ultimately, people don't really care how something's made; they just want the final product. It's almost like you take your your computer into to the Geek Squad at Best Buy. It's like, hey man, my computer's not working. And they, they start talking to like gigahertz and operating systems. And like, dude, I, I don't even know what you're saying. I've been here 10 minutes and you're like talking jargon. Like, can my computer work or not? And that's what our clients come in with the mindset of, hey man, I, I just want to feel good. I want to work out. I want to be healthier when I come out of this. So when you when you're looking at it from that perspective, it is where are they at today, like right now in this moment? Yeah, if they have play hip flexors, let's foam roll them a bit, let's activate them, let's do some dynamic activation, and then let's coach them through it. Like, can we brace through it? Because if someone can move through a pattern and you coach them up through it, that active range of motion with stability is essentially going to fix what they're feeling, where they're tight, make them feel better. So I was saying my go to screens and assessments would be the exercise that they are looking to improve upon. So we'll do that, you know, at a body weight level or a really easy level. I can screen that right away and now I can scale it. I love it. I love it. And partially why is that that was actually the process, basically the same process that I utilized when working with clients was I forgot the exact person, and I believe it was one of my graduate professors that said it, but basically utilizing each session as a way to acquire information about your client, or he worked a lot with athletes. So he would basically say that each session, each time you worked with them is a way to acquire information and almost treat it like an assessment. And those items will play into the rest of your programming, but also that session. How, what was affecting them that day? Was work hard? How did they sleep? Are there any other emotional stressors? How are they moving when they walked in? All items that you mentioned. And I think that sometimes a new trainer will come to uh, a facility or become a personal trainer and want to go through all the things that they learned in the textbook, which is great. You know, you got to start somewhere and you got to start getting some experience. But as you progress through the industry, you learn I'll say what assessments and how you acquire that information to make a program will work, but also the business at end of it. And I, and you did touch on this in that part, what the client will want to feel something. So exactly how you said, if, so, if you spend 45 minutes working on assessments over at squats, planks, pushups, whatever assessment that you're going through, they're probably going to be pretty mad. And then they're probably not going to want to, sign up with you at the end of the day. So finding ways to incorporate assessments, what exercises you feel they can do based off of, maybe you spend 30 minutes prior 
to them coming to the gym, talking with them. What's their background? What do they do? What type of work are they typically doing today? What type of activities? So you can kind of see where you can push them when they are with you so that you can, so that you can acquire that information, which is all great, really good stuff. And I think that a lot of that is experience. It's your experience of working with this population and having an, a background in education and pursuing education, which is great. So Nick, as we get to the podcast takeaways, and I say this every single time I ask this question, but where this came from was a documentary that I watched on Netflix about a gentleman that did 50 Ironmans in 50 states. So this person was asked about three lies about doing Ironmans. I thought it was a great question, but for the fitness industry. So Nick, what are three lies about the fitness industry based off your experiences? Well, I, th I think the first one is that, you know, change is easy or there's some kind of simple solution, right? And so people promote that as like, hey, here's my great six ab exercises. But that's a complete lie. Like you can't take just six exercises and be like, oh, here's your go-to, like do this, you'll have six back. Because it comes into, you know, we know this, nutrition and everything else, uh, the toilet seat and all those, all those pieces. But it's the, it's the perception of change is simple. Whereas we, we present this simple solution to a complex problem, and, and that's a lot because it is perception based, right? So your clients come in and like the first thing I'll ask you is like, look, man, let's, let's get to know you a little bit. Talk, talk to me about your life, talk to me about all this stuff that's going on, it's like work, stuff, work stuff, family stuff. Like, look, I want to be around for my family and need to make money. So my ultimate question is, well, let's be honest, like, you came in, you're, like, you're committed to this. Well, what does that mean, right? Like, how much effort do you really want to put into this? To be honest, you can be like, I am 100% committed to cutting back work and doing all these things and everything you say. But what I found is, most guys are like, look, you know, like make it practical for me. Like what really matters? And and that's what I think we need to boil down to is like lie number one is like there's no like simple fix, there's no simple solution, but it's a simple system that you can implement to be like, hey, how about we just tweak these things? Because a tweak of something that you're already doing is really simple, right? And it's almost semantics when you hear this. But if I say, hey, we're going to change your diet completely, like, yep, you're going to be a rock star for 10 days, and then you're going to go off the edge, you can go boozing for a weekend, and eat pizza and everything else. But if I just said, how about instead of like cutting anything out of your food, all I ask you to do is get protein and, and a vegetable twice a day. So, yeah, that's simple. And all of a sudden, people are doing these simple things, and it's like, yeah, what, what do you got next? What's next? That's easy. Um, so it's, I think the simple fixes is number one uh, and just changing the semantics and how things are presented. I'd say number two is, I mean, the biggest lie is like, look, the, the best people in the fitness industry that are putting out the most relevant actual information are typically the ones doing research and that are working 60 hours with the clients. So they're spending their time, you know, writing journal articles or writing articles for good websites, putting out good free information. They're not the ones that are Instagram models, right? Like if you look at an Instagram model and try and do any kind of search on like, well, what articles did they write? You know, what's their background? And they have them, they just look good. Like that's just, it's, they're, they're gonna be young, great genetics, and they're really pretty people. Uh, and more power to them because you know, maybe they get them Get their followers working out more. Cool. I want to hit on them. Um, but the the Instagram, the social media, like just because you're popular doesn't make you good. Um, I'd say those are those are my two go tos. Uh, in terms of a third, oh, I, I think that the the one that just hurts me, and I don't know this is my my real third, but the biggest hurt is string muscles on you know it's, it's the perception of hey here's here's the great biceps and people are still talking about training training muscles instead of training movements 
right? So if you, if you train movements, if you get really strong in fun, fun, uh, fun, fundamental patterns, squat, run, change, push, pull, press, carry, if you're really rock solid in those, all your accessory muscles are going to get developed, like everything else is going to come together because it goes back to the motor control. So it's the, it's the muscles mindset that people have as opposed to how do we move better so that we can increase longevity and feel better. You know, you, can, you end up looking good, you know, to an nth degree over, hey, I went to the gym, I did three different arm exercises for you know, three or four sets of 10 to 12 reps. Like, great, you got like big muscles. Uh, it, it's the movement piece that we as professionals need to train in people. You know, look, you move better, you'll feel better. Live better. I like that. I like that, and partly because one of the things that I rarely do, and one one of the last training gigs that I did was working with a high school baseball team. And one time, I had a lecture with them about stop doing bicep curls when they're in the gym with me. Stop doing these when you have other items to get through. And I will admit, and this is not bragging too much, but. I had relatively nice arms and I rarely, rarely, then there was a period when I didn't even do bicep curls, but what did I do a lot of? I did a lot of back exercises. I did my bent over rows. I did my chin ups, pull ups, or my body weight rows, TRX rows, all those types of things where the biceps are assisting in it. And look what happened. My biceps looked good. And so I hundred percent agree with all those. They're all good items. Nick, before we pop off, can you share where people can find you on social media or any items like that? Yeah, so right now, uh, I literally just went went rogue. Uh, I've had these ideas of doing my own thing for 15 plus years now, and uh, it's time. So I'm in the process of building building a website and all of those pieces. Awesome. Uh, the website is going to be livenjcfit.com, uh, NJC are my initials. Uh, Right now, the easiest way is Facebook. Uh, I know everyone's on Instagram, but my population, the older guys, are, uh, are Facebook folks. So it's just NJC Fit on Facebook, NJC Fit is Solutions. Um, I've got an Instagram account, but uh, honestly, I keep that personal. It's not my, my target demographic, and uh, I don't like to post all that pers much personal stuff. Uh, so find me on Facebook. Hit me up, uh, sign up for NJC Fitness Solutions. I'll be coming out with a newsletter pretty soon. Uh, hopefully, we're going to launch October 1st of 2020. And uh, we're putting out good content for everybody. Good stuff. Good stuff, Nick. Thanks for coming on the episode, sharing a lot of great training items, application items to utilize right away for people that are listening to this episode. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, man. It's always good to uh, help share the knowledge. And uh, I, I think the stronger our industry gets, the better it gets. And, and ultimately, people will appreciate that. And uh, improving their health.